Hi, this is Chris Campbell, and welcome to the Food Institute podcast. This week, we'll be speaking with Abby Pryor, SVP of Sales and Marketing at Bright Farms, about the challenges and advantages of indoor farming. But before we get started, I'd like to ask all of our listeners today to share this episode with their friends and family. It's really a huge help to us, and I want to thank everyone who's done so before. And if you're new to the podcast, please like, comment, and share. It extends our reach, and we really appreciate it when you do so. So to start us off, I'll introduce Abby and ask her how she's doing today. So how are you today, Abby? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for for having me today. Oh, we're really excited about this episode. And I think one of the things that we can do to start it off is just to ask you to give us a brief background on yourself, your professional career, and how you ended up with Bright Farms in the first place. Sure, I appreciate it. So I have spent my my whole career in the food industry. Uh, I started at, at one of the biggest food producers in the world, Unilever, uh, working on the Ragu brand to be specific. And I think, you know, there I received excellent classical training in understanding the consumer and really, you know, getting to consumer insights and developing brands and marketing programs that that spoke to consumers' needs. Um, and, you know, the other remarkable company in my background prior to Bright Farms was Bimbo Bakeries USA. I, I um, spent most of my time there, about eight years on the premium bread business, the whole grain bread business, about a, about a billion dollar business at, at Bimbo Bakeries. And there, you know, continued the sort of classical big brand learning um, and and also a lot of leadership training that helped me sort of prepare for the next steps in my career. And as I was leading the, the marketing side for the premium bread business at Bimbo, this opportunity at Bright Farms came across my radar. And it was, you know, quite frankly, irresistible. It was an opportunity to take that learning and that training that I have gotten from larger food companies and funnel it towards an organization that was just getting started, um, that is mission-driven, that really aligned with my values and the type of food that I wanted to sell and market, but also feed to my family, and to build a company with the type of culture um, that I wanted. And so I've been at Bright Farms now for about six years. I joined at the very early stages when we were just a couple hundred thousand dollars in revenue, if I recall, um, and have been part of scaling this business to be the largest, you know, indoor grown local brand scaling across the U.S. So looking at that transition, was it a difficult transition for you? I know you said you were excited about it, but you know the learnings that you took from these more traditional CPG brands, did you find the transition difficult? And you know, you kind of already touched upon what inspired the change, but any other kind of insight into what made you decide to fully switch over would be probably beneficial for our listeners to, to get a better handle on. Sure. I, I went from these massive organizations filled with resources uh, and learning on how to get things done to being truly the only marketing and sales hire in the whole organization. I was one of about five headquarters employees when I joined Bright Farms. So, you know, I went from, you know, leading a a large team of people and large cross-functional teams to being a a one-woman show for at least the first year as we were really trying to build this business. So that in itself was a big challenge, although also really exciting. And the switch from consumer packaged goods to produce was also a a major change. I went from products that had much longer shelf life, much more predictability in the ingredients and and the production cycle to produce, which is, you know, selling a, a product that is growing and living just hours before you deliver it to the customer. So it's a much more immediate industry. It's, um, you know, when we harvest a product, it is harvested and shipped to a customer within 24 hours. So it went from planning in years and months down to literally planning in days and hours. Uh, really exciting industry to be a part of. It makes every day really exciting. Um, but it was certainly a big change uh, going from such a lar- such large art organizations with so many resources to a, a tiny organization at the time that was really focused on every single day. We were just one little tiny farm in eastern Pennsylvania when I joined Bright Farms. 
So that 24 hour timeline is pretty interesting to me. And I was hoping you could explain the logistics of Bright Farms kind of, you know, from a growing operation to a consumer's table. What does that journey look like? So one of the things that's so great about our journey is that it's really simple. And many consumers don't understand how complex the journey of most of the salad that they eat, uh, whether it be in a restaurant or whether buying at a grocery store, it's an extremely complex journey. It's typically field grown on the West Coast. It's then brought into packing houses. It's then commingled with product from all sorts of other farms. It's then shipped out to different packers and then makes its way to a grocery store. For Bright Farms, it's much simpler. Uh, we seed grow, harvest, pack, and ship all of our salad greens from a single farm. So a product that is harvested at eight o'clock in the morning, goes into a cooler for a couple of hours, might be harvested in the mid-afternoon, and it's typically showing up in a retailer's distribution center or on, or, or if it's going direct to store, in the store itself early the next morning, by maybe 5 a.m. the next morning. So it's a very fast turn. Uh, and we're able to do that because our greenhouses have the technology and the growing and packing and harvesting environments to be really self-sufficient. So it really truly is changing the supply chain of produce and particularly of salad greens makes it cleaner, simpler, and safer, quite frankly, than um, the West Coast supply chain, which is quite complex, and commingles products from many different farms into a single package. So I think consumers are a little bit confused when it comes to the old idea of indoor farming. Um, the reality is most consumers, they're basis of comparison is just a traditional farm versus an indoor farm, although there are some differentiations in the indoor farming space. So I was hoping you can kind of give our listeners, uh, you know, a view into the different types of indoor farms. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. I think that's a great question because I get that question, quite frankly, from, from retailers and customers all of the time. It can be very confusing. So within indoor farming, there are two primary types of farms, particularly when we talk about salad greens. So vertical farms are farms that look more like warehouses. They're typically in urban areas and they use almost exclusively artificial light and artificial energy to grow the plants. Greenhouses are another type of indoor farm. Bright Farms is a greenhouse grower. We use the sun to grow our plants. Typically, we go just outside of urban areas where we can have the land to grow horizontally. Um, so we grow and, and our crop is flat because we are using the energy from the sun to grow. So greenhouses and vertical farms both fall into indoor farming and both are really growing segments within the category today. Um, greenhouses today in, in this sort of local indoor salad category, however, make up about 80 to 90 percent of the total sales. All right. So what makes Bright Farm stand out in this field then? What's the you know competitive advantage that your company has compared to other greenhouse operations or even other vertical farms in this indoor category? Yeah. So Bright Farms, we have the best network today of farms covering the U.S. So we have farms in Pennsylvania, Virginia, Illinois, Ohio, opening very soon in North Carolina, under construction in Massachusetts, looking at markets all over the Southeast and the West. So today, you know, we already are building a network of farms that meet the needs of large national and or regional retailers. We've also got five years of experience and success in those retailers. So we can bring a real proven case study and results to the market that show we can drive category growth. And that network of farms really is valuable to retailers that we work with because we can use them to help be redundant for the other. Big spikes in demand, we can use our network of farms to really support each other, um, which is really meaningful when it comes to consistent supply for retailers. Beyond that, you know, as we look at the awareness of brands within this space, 
consumers know the Bright Farms brand already. We are the we are the most well known brand in the space. Um, and, you know, we've really worked very hard to create a connection with consumers to help them understand why and how we grow. We're a mission-driven company. We're about improving the health of the planet and improving the health of Americans. And we really make our decisions based around that. And the consumer sees what we're doing um, and understands that their dollars are going more, to more than just a salad purchase, but to really making a decision that's better for them and better for the for the environment. So has Bright Farms thought about utilizing vertical farms or will you be staying specifically in that greenhouse sector? Yeah, I think today we feel like we have the best model as it pertains to quality, our ability to deliver the product at a cost that most consumers can participate with. That's really important to us. We want to make sure that most consumers can access the brand at, at the price point that we put to shelf. And, you know, we also feel like we've got, you know, a really efficient model that's working. So we have a system called Bright OS. It's, it's essentially the brain of Bright Farms. It pulls in all of the data from all of our farms and it delivers back really consistent product excellent efficiency that enables us to deliver it at a price to consumers that right now is winning in the market. That being said, things can change over the years. I think, you know, as more, as advances are made in, you know, the energy usage of LEDs or the cost of LEDs, we wouldn't take it off the table. It just needs to meet our lens of our mission, which is, is this the best way we can grow for the planet? And can we deliver access to more Americans using that technology? And if the answer to both of those were to become yes, we would consider it. Today, we don't consider the technology that is available and the methods that are available to meet those hurdles. We think the greenhouse model that we have um, is, the better, is, is the better choice today. And what about different product categories? I know Bright Farms is pretty much focused right now on leafy greens, but have you thought about doing other uh, greenhouse grown vegetables like maybe tomatoes, cucumbers, et cetera? Certainly. I, you're, you're right. Today, we are really focused on the salad category because today we, we, we you know participate in the baby leaf portion of the salad category. We've got tons of runway just in salads. We can do heads, we can do kits, we can do bowls and all sorts of different things you're used to seeing in the store when you go to the salad, the, your salad wall, if you will. So we've got tons of extension to do just there. But there are certain categories that offer, we think, a lot of value being grown indoors in the future. Um, tomatoes are largely there already. We sort of see tomatoes as an example of where salads will go. So many tomatoes have gone from, you know, field grown now to indoor. But we see berries as, as a really potential interesting category. And there's, there's a lot of interest there right now. Um, it's not our focus today, but it certainly will be as we continue to grow and scale. And something else I'd like to talk about is just the locally grown aspect of your company. Uh, something at the Food Institute we've been tracking for years here is just that consumers seem to be looking more and more for these local foods. With the caveat that the pandemic obviously shifted some consumer behavior, I was just wondering what kind of changes you've seen with your consumers uh, since the start of the pandemic, if any kind of changes at all. Yeah, I think there's two things that have happened um, since the start of the pandemic. One, consumers absolutely uh, are looking for more information and more transparency about where their products are coming from and what they're bringing home to their families. So we have continued to increase the transparency of our products. We put QR codes on the front of every package that you can actually tour the farm. You can meet the head grower. You can meet the manager of that farm. Um, and you can really go deep on exactly where your product, where your food has come from. And, and, and so the consumer demand has grown and the consumer engagement with the information that we share has continued to grow. And then on the retailer side, there was a fair amount of disruption in supply. Right. Um, in terms of, you know, getting getting packaging supplies in disruptions in labor, um, disruptions in trucking. So we have been able to keep our consumers, or our customers full with product 
throughout the pandemic. And so that has grown our sales as well, because, you know, when, when there are disruptions in, in the competition on the shelf, certainly we benefit. Um, and so I would say, you know, we have, we have seen growth of about 70% um, since the start of the pandemic. And, you know, we continue to just try to put everything in place to make sure that we're getting the right message to the consumer and that we are delivering that consistency that our retailers need, because both of those things are, are really fueling the, the growth of not only Bright Farms, but of indoor grown salads overall. So that's a, obviously a large number right there, 70%. So it makes me wonder, I know that you have this background and, you know, a mission statement at Bright Farms, but you find a lot of these new consumers were just looking for, you know, a steady supply of greens during the pandemic, or are these new converts over to this mission statement, you know, this healthier earth initiative almost that your company kind of portrays? Yeah, it's and it's interesting. And over the six years that I've been with Bright Farms, I've seen it really change. When we would when we would do you know um, research with our consumers or get feedback from our consumers six years ago, local was really the primary driving message. And what we're finding over the last year to two years is the importance of clean, protected produce has really dramatically increased. So it's not just about local. It's about produce that is pesticide free, that is clean, that is safe. So it's not just the E. coli scares. It's also the understanding of what am I putting in my body from a from a pesticide or a chemical perspective. Um, and so both of those things are really winning with consumers. And I think, you know, we we saw this even in the recalls over the last couple of years. We have a, a particular customer that went during one of the romaine recalls. We saw a 30% lift in sales coming out of the romaine recall because, again, you know, when, when the West Coast product wasn't on the shelf, consumers that maybe didn't know us gave us a try and they stayed. We've talked about it a few times here. Uh, you know, the E. coli outbreaks linked to Yuma and Salinas over the last couple of years kind of created a negative halo for produce, uh, you know, leafy greens particularly. And I know that your products don't have the same issue, but I was wondering you know, did you face consumer headwinds because of that? Did you have to engage in some kind of educational kind of material to try to showcase the difference between your products and conventional grown, uh, you know, greens during those periods? We did. Um, you know, immediately upon any of those recalls, we uh, social is, is a big outlet for engaging consumers with us. Um, and so we put out very clear messages just around we're safe. And that seemed to resonate resonate with consumers and stick. Uh, our most our our ha most highly engaged social posts in the history of Bright Farms have always been about safety, and um, so I think we did see some dips in the total category around those recall times. But we did not see dips with Bright Farms, uh, in part because we were able to stay on shelf and drive some trial during those periods of recalls. And also because I think that was those were points when consumers were really looking to be educated and we were offering that opportunity. So, you know, I, I do think that consumers have a little bit of a hangover, if you will, as it as it relates to E. coli and particularly romaine, but we have not seen that reflect back on our business. So Abby, can you share Bright Farms plans for 2021? Yes. So we are opening our North Carolina farm in May of this year, which is very exciting. It will be our fifth commercial scale farm. We are already under construction in Massachusetts, which will be opening in early 2022. And we'll also be starting the expansion of our farm in Illinois in 2021 and breaking ground in Texas. So 2021 is really a, is, is about building the future for Bright Farms. And the newer farms that we're building are significantly larger in size because we're finding that demand has outpaced supply in our current in our current farms, which is an exciting place to be. 
So you will see bright farms dramatically increase. Um, looking at farms now, instead of four to five acres, we're talking about 15 to 30 acres in each of these markets to really dramatically increase our capacity and begin the true transition from West Coast to indoor grown in salads. Well, it certainly sounds like you will all be busy over the next couple of years. And I really want to thank you for your time today, Abby. I was wondering, where can our listeners go to learn more about you and Bright Farms in particular? Certainly. Uh, our brightfarms.com website has a lot of information on what we do, how and why we do it. Uh, so I would encourage um, listeners to please visit us there. And I welcome the connection on LinkedIn. Uh, certainly would love to continue the conversation with any listeners who are interested. Well, I certainly appreciate that. And we'll definitely share the relevant links in the description of this video. And I think that brings us to the end of today's recording session. So remember, if you're new to the Food Institute podcast, please follow, like, and share. And if you'd like to learn more about the Food Institute, please take a look at the links in our description to learn more about us and what membership could do for you and your company. So until next time, this is Chris Campbell signing off. Mm -hmm.